Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Hope everybody's doing good. Um, I'm, I'm just glad that you're coming back after <laughs> the last couple of classes talking about the Septuagint and the Apocrypha. Um, these are kind of weighty issues, and uh, we're going to kind of summarize those issues tonight and, and make them and kind of connect them to the reason why we're studying this. <clears throat> and, uh, and then after today, we'll, we'll move on to maybe less oblique issues that uh, will help us. almost into the last month of the quarter and <clears throat> I don't know about you but I have uh, really en enjoyed this class and I've learned a lot and hope we can, can, can continue to just glean pearls and, <clears throat> and understanding in, in, a, in a way to better understand the New Testament and its context and, and, and all those things. So we're, we're going to be getting into some really good information <clears throat> and you know we're going to spend some time talking about some events that, that led up to the Jewish revolt, the Great Jewish Revolt um, in AD 70. Um, <clears throat> because re remember that the seeds of that revolt really are born um, <clears throat> uh, when the Romans come in um, in 63 BC. So we'll talk a little bit about more of that. We'll also get into a little bit more of the, <clears throat> uh, of the a little bit more of the foundational aspects of the, the two main parties that we're going to be looking at in the New Testament, the Pharisees and Sadducees. We'll dig into a little bit more of that as we go through the class. <clears throat> um, some of the things that we, that we have on the list of things to do, one of them is the, is the, the, the Herod family, which we spent a little bit of time on. And, um, <clears throat> but you know, the, knowing and understanding the background of Herod and how that connects to the New Testament and how he and his alliances with Rome help us to have a, a maybe a better understanding of, of, his, um, of the, some of the decisions he made and some of the things he did. But we'll, one of the things that I think that'll be very enjoyable is to share with you some of the monumental building efforts that, that he did. I mean, he, Herod was known as a great builder. He was also known as a complete, you know, maniacal, uh, maybe bipolar or just, I mean, just really a guy that had, uh, you know, just a, a massive uh, degree of paranoia. And uh, <clears throat> for a couple of guys that have been to, to Israel, um, you'll, you'll recognize some of the places. I've already started putting some pictures together of some of the places that, that he built um, <clears throat> and how those kind of connect to the... Uh, um, and, and just to give you an example, you know, we, we talked about <clears throat> Philip the Tetrarch, one of Herod's sons. He's going to found Caesarea Philippi. Well, if you go to Jerusalem today, is it called Caesarea Philippi? Of course not. You know what it's called? In Israel today, it's called Paneas. P-A-N-E-A-S. Paneas. So <clears throat> what, what, what's the root of that word? Do you remember you know, um, what, what that area of Caesarea Philippi was known for, going all back to, to, to Alexander? Pan. It's exactly right. Yeah, Pan, the god Pan. And does anybody remember what Pan looked like? Remember the old 19, I think, 97 Hercules movie by Disney? <clears throat> Danny DeVito played this character. That's one of my favorite Disney movies. I love, I love that. <laughs> I love that movie. You guys know what I'm talking about? Hercules, the Disney version of Hercules. Yeah, he half goat, half man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was Pan, <clears throat> and Pan was the god of, of mischief. Pan was the god who resided in um, in um, in this cave that that was in that was in this area, uh, that was no, that was called Caesarea. But Caesarea Philippi was a huge pagan site of worship. 
did you guys go to Pan with a cave where, you know, the, the gates of Hades? I don't think we were able to make it up. And even if we did, there was a dust storm, remember that? We couldn't see anything. Um, but, uh, but helping to understand the context of, because, you know, that's where Jesus took his, his disciples. And it's right there in that context, right in front of this, this shrine to Pan, that he's going to ask his disciples, who do men say that I am? Who do men say that I am? And remember what Peter says. Remember, can anybody quote what he said? You're the Christ, the Son of what? Of the living God. And you, if you've ever read that and go, why would he say the living God? Because he is literally standing in the context of paganism everywhere around him. There's, there's statues. There's, there was a temple to Augustus. There was a temple to Pan. There was, I mean... So all of that connects into, um, you know, the, the Hellenism. I mean, Hellenism was, was a, a, a significant influence in Jesus' time. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we need, this, we need to finish our discussion on the Septuagint. So as we begin doing that, let's, let's bow together and let's pray. Our dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this day. We're so grateful for your Son. And dear Father, as we study these things, we study really the, how your, your inspired uh, writers used the Old Testament and, and through, the, through the Holy Spirit gave us the scriptures. We pray that you give us understanding. We pray that you give us a, an understanding to, de to defend the veracity of the scriptures. And we pray, dear Father, that you give us faith and help build our faith and the, and the, the, the truthfulness and the power of your word that we can depend on despite translations and despite time that's passed. Um, dear Father, we love you. We thank you for uh, just the power and the, the, the wonder of, of, of your word that you've given to us. Thank you for your son. We, we pray for all those that are sick. We know there's many that are not well. Um, we just pray you be with them. And in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so just as a reminder, <clears throat> I gave you an assignment. And the assignment was, uh, well, someone tell me what the assignment was. Yeah, so I ask you to do a little bit of research and, and, and maybe, and, and listen, I'm not going to judge you if you did not. <laughs> this is uh, not, not casual reading. But can someone share with me what they found? And because and, and, and it, it, we're going we're gonna to kind of wrap the Septuagint up and why it's important to understand what the Septuagint is and what it's not. Because there is a lot of misunderstanding about what the Septuagint is. And there's even probably more misunderstanding about how the apostles used Old Testament scripture. Um, so let's, 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 hear some, let's hear some answers. Number one, you know, did Jesus quote from the Septuagint? And, and again, that, that question is, in, is inerrantly, it's a little bit of a trick question. And... and, 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 and <laughs> I, I, can't, I, I think Michael knows why it's a trick question because we talked about this the other night at the ball game. So what's, your, what's the answer? Now, I've, yeah, please go ahead. Jesus is the word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> you were exactly right. Yes. You're exactly right, Annie. Does someone have the answer, Jesus loves us? Is that? Yes. You're exactly right. I'm messing with you. You're right. All right. All right. So what's, uh, what say you? And why is it important? Carol? Did Jesus quote from the Septuagint? Everything I read, it was from the Apocrypha. Okay. What, what did you learn about the Apocrypha? What, 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 because we, we kind of, I kind of brought up the Apocrypha. Um, seven additional books that are in the Septuagint that were added to the Septuagint. There are more apocryphal books, but what say you about the Apocrypha? Well, of course, this was written by a Catholic person, I'm sure. Okay. Um, it, was, it just gave some scriptures that were quoted by Jesus, by Paul, that you could find similar things in the Apocrypha. Okay, okay. Now, John, do I believe this? I don't know. No, well, uh, let me, so here's the thing. The, the, I, I have never read these books. Right. These books 
are in really no way ever quoted. They're, they're the one reference to an apocryphal book, actually two apocryphal books, is in the book of Jude. That is the only instance in which, which the apocrypha is even referred to at a glance. Um, so there's no quotes. Jesus never acknowledges the presence of the apocrypha in any way, shape, or form. The disciples don't either, except with the exception of Jude, making reference to the assumption of Moses in the book of Enoch. So, so from those two apocryphal studies, he drew what, what evidently was a common understanding among Jewish people that that, that event took place. Um, you know, if you ask me whether I think that took place, I'd say, yeah. I mean, if, if he writes and uses that reference, I would say, yeah, it took place. Is he quoting from those books? I'd say, no, he's not quoting from those books. In fact, if you look at the way those references are used with the Satan fight, fighting over uh, the body of Moses, the way he uses that is different than it's used in those apocryphal books. But what remains is, the, is that event, or at least that, that notion. That doesn't mean you quoted from it. Okay, so that's, okay. Yes? I didn't get to spend very much time on this at all. I did find it interesting. One, one source that I looked at noted that the Jews, the Jews held up the Septuagint as inspired writings up until about the second or third century AD. Okay when they tried to separate themselves from the Christians and reverted back to uh, start trying to, to push Hebrew text again and, and get away from, from Greek. Okay, so that's a really good point. I don't know if you heard this, but let me, let me restate it and then fill in a, and just kind of unpack that. So again, according to the letter of Aristeas, and I read you and I told you that it was a letter that's well attested historically. But the story is pure legend. I mean, the, the, the way in which, now, now were translators brought up from Jerusalem to Egypt? Possibly. Um, did they complete their translation in 72 days? There's no way. Did they, did they come to the same, you know, same, did they all come up with word for word, same translation? No way. So it, that event is well attested um, and and what Jews would say is this about the Septuagint. They would say that, number one, the only thing that was, that was commissioned to be performed and the only thing that should be called the Septuagint is the Pentateuch, okay? Because that's what all, what the letter of Aristeus, Aristeus commissioned. So that event, when the Septuagint came into place, was the Pentateuch, was the first five books. And by all accounts, most scholars, when they look at the Pentateuch and the Hebrew text, they're very similar, very well done, not a whole lot of controversy. It's the, it's the other books that, that are sometimes referred to as Septuagint when it's not Septuagint. So, so this begs the question, so the, the Jews believe, and you, this is where you're going, the Jews believed that, um, that over time it began to become it be, the, the Septuagint, that, those first five books of the Old Testament, and then the additional books over a period of time into the second century BC, first century BC, they began to be translated into Greek. When Jerome in the fourth century begins to, when he's commissioned with translating the Bible from the Septuagint, to the Latin, the first thing he says in his writings is that there's, there's, a, there's too many copies of the Septuagint out there. there. There's multiple versions of that. Most of them are bad, which means that there was not just one Septuagint. Um, and so we use that word loosely um, when it actually we should just be referring to them as a Greek translation. And so many Greek translations were happening over a period of time and, and yes, the Jews acknowledge that the first five books were done right. They do not acknowledge that the rest were done right. They, they just believe that that took place over time. There's probably good translations, bad translations, just like there are today. You open up your living Bible, that's hardly a translation. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a paraphrasical type translation. So just like it is today, it existed back there with Greek translations. There were good ones, there were bad ones. But here's the thing, we do not have one existent manuscript from the days of Jesus of a Septuagint. So if I asked you, well, what Septuagint was Jesus quoting from? We don't know. It doesn't exist. 
what Jesus is quoting from was obviously that the writers are writing the books in what language? When the New Testament writers are writing, they're writing in Greek, right? So is there, when you translate Hebrew to Greek, is every word going to correspond perfectly into the modern day language? It doesn't now. It didn't then. So, so there were probably good translations, there were probably bad translations, and somewhere in between. So imagine Jerome, he's, he's told to, to translate from the Septuagint to the Latin. He says, there's no way, there's too many bad translations out there. I'm going to go back to the Hebrew. And so he translates the Vulgate from Hebrew to Latin. Okay, so in that same arena, actually a little bit before that, there's a guy who's, who's a prominent New Testament church father, and his name was Origen. You've heard of, you've heard of that church father, and his name is Origen. Well, Jews believe that Origen manipulated the current or the, the available Septuagint or the old, the Greek, you know, the Greek Bible, that he manipulated it to turn it into a messianic, um, you know, propagandist type translation. So the Jews believe that at that moment that the Septuagint was, was, um, was manipulated, uh, perverted into this pro-Christian movement. And, and, and what Jews claim is that that uh, they, they overtly just change text. And, and let me just say, there's no evidence whatsoever that that took place. In fact, Jews' understanding of what Origen did is grossly misunderstood. What Origen did was Origen recognized that there was a lot of different Greek translations out there. And he, he set about, to, and he lived in Egypt. He set about to try to, um, to compare the existing Septuagint to the Hebrew in, in multiple ever, other languages. In fact, he, he produced what's called the, the Hexa, the, uh, it's, it's called the um, Hexateuch, which is, a, which is a text which has you know, multiple lines. And, and he was a brilliant guy. He actually learned Hebrew. So his effort was to try, in recognition of there being problems with the Septuagint, to go back to what? The original language. So that's exactly right. So second century AD, maybe a little bit later, Jews claim that the Christians start manipulating the Old Testament. For what purpose? Why would Jews say that Christians were manipulating the text? The text <laughs> yeah, so they claim that, that Christians manipulated the, 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 the Greek translation in order to make it pro-Messianic. Here's the thing. You know, in your Old Testament, you, you're not looking at a Greek translation. You're looking at a Hebrew translation. And, you, and, and if I were to go through and ask you to point out to me Messianic verses that are, I mean, as obvious as anything in the Hebrew text, the Masoretic text in your Bibles, there's, you can probably take me to a hundred different places. So that claim is bogus. Those Old Testament references were there. They're in the Hebrew. They were also in the Septuagint. Um, so again, that's a bogus claim. So, uh, the point is, 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 is this. Unfortunately, all, the only copies of the, uh, let me just put it, I, see, I, I almost made the same, same mistake. The, the only copies of Greek manuscripts that we have are those texts that we mentioned, the Vaticanus, the Sinaiticanus, and the, Alex, the Alexandrius. Those three texts, they're, they're, they're not complete. There's some books missing, there's verses missing. It's not a very good translation, but we call those the Septuagint. What's the problem with that? The, those aren't the Septuagint. It's kind of like, um, unfortunately, over time, what, what happened with the Septuagint and that language is what happens to Kleenex. So do you know what I'm, you know what I'm getting at? So if I ask you to hand me a Kleenex, what are you going to do? Are you going to go around looking for a Kleenex box or are you going to hand me a tissue? You're going to just hand me a tissue, right? So Kleenex, has, it's, it's like Coke, too. You know, give me a Coke, and you hand them a Pepsi, and they're, oh, that's fine. That's a Coke, right? Yeah. Well, that, that's what happened to this, this term Septuagint. Folks, the, the only Septuagint was the Pentateuch that was, that was created and, trans, that, and translated back in the 3rd century B.C. 
Every other quote-unquote Septuagint isn't a Septuagint. It's just a Greek translation. Does that make sense? And so, okay. Now let me go back to the question. Did Jesus quote from the Septuagint? <laughs> and why did I say earlier that that was a trick question? How would, yeah, how would you know? That's, we, don't know what, we don't know what the Septuagint looked like yeah. in Jesus' day. And, and one of the, it, it appears that a lot of the places where it claims that Jesus quoted from the Septuagint would have been from Isaiah or another book that would have been included in the original Septuagint translation, right? If, it, if it only did the Pentateuch, who knows what? Anyway, you get down a rabbit hole. Was, was he reading from what the original 70, if there were even 70 of them, was he reading what they originally translated? How, would, how on earth would you ever know? That's, that's right. So we don't have a, even a remnant of of what the quote-unquote Greek translation of the day was when Jesus is there. But what I want you to think about is this, and I'm, I'm going to kind of skip a lot of slides here to get to, to get to these last couple slides here. All right, so I want you to, I want you to just to take a look at this slide and, and read these with me, because this is where the rubber meets the road, as they say. So the New Testament writers... Again, follow this logic here, okay? Because this is kind of a quote. The New Testament writers, not having taken care to quote in absolute agreement with the original text of the Old Testament, it is urged, or in other words, it's claimed, could not have held the doctrine of plenary inspiration. Otherwise, they would have shown greater respect for the letter of Scripture. This is the kind of issue that faces us as Christians today. So when you look at the way that the, the New Testament writers quoted the Old Testament, in, in many instances, it's paraphrased. It's, he'll, he'll, there's a combination of several verses that are put together. By all accounts, from our angle, it looks as though that they handled it very loosely. Okay, that makes sense? And so, some would say, well, if the apostles looked at Scripture that loosely, we should not look at, at Scripture in a plenary inspired way. What's the answer? I mean, if you consider that they were inspired, they're not handling it loosely, they're writing it as inspired. Okay. Okay, all right, that's a good point. What else would you say is wrong with this, this hypothesis or this, this statement? <clears throat> the, what, we, what we should ask if this is ever presented to us is <clears throat> how do we know that they mishandled it? And, 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 and what's your proof that they mishandled it? Um, and, and the other thing I would say with, with many of these claims that Jesus is quoting from the Septuagint. Well, the bottom line is, is that you have to think about this. Think about these things. First of all, if you're translating a quote, you're putting it in, you know, if it was originally in Hebrew, you're, you're putting it into Greek. You're pulling it into Greek. So what's that going to look like when you convert that or translate that from Hebrew to Greek? It's going to look Greek. So it, 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 it should not be surprising that many of, of Jesus' statements, the Old Testament quotations, look Greek because the New Testament writers are, are, are taking, the, you know, taking that Old Testament Hebrew writing and turning it into, into Greek. Does that make sense? Does that, uh, maybe that doesn't make sense. Does that make sense? Does everybody follow that? Okay, so the other thing too is this. You and I live in the 21st century. Most of us, a lot, some of you went to college. Some of you have probably at some point been asked to write a paper. And if you've ever been asked to write a paper, you probably were told, okay, well, well when you quote someone, what do you have to do? In a paper, what do you do? Right? So you, you're going to put it in, you know, parenthetical statements or whatever. You're going to put it in parentheses. And then you're going to cite your source. Right? Okay. Did that concept or notion exist in the first century? 
<laughs> no, no. <laughs> Guys, uh, m much of this is a misunderstanding and a, and a, and a twisting of the reality of, of the way that, that a first century author would have written anything. When they quoted something, they weren't held to a standard that we hold today as, car, as part of the Chicago manual or some other manual. I mean, you, you guys know what I'm saying. The New Testament writers weren't held to that standard. I, I, you know, it's, it's like this. So if, if, I, um, if I wrote something, if, let's just say I wrote a poem back in, you know, you know, when I was 12 years old, back in the 1980s. And then, um, and then later in life, I take that poem that I wrote and I change it and I update it. Do, do I have to cite myself or do I have to in some way, is it, do I have to in some way state a, uh, that there's a, that, you know, that, that, uh, that I have a right to do that? Why, why, why can I do that freely with no problem? Because I'm the author of both. Now, if I took a, a poem that Michael wrote and I, you know, le many years later manipulated it or changed it or did something like that, I would have to ask permission. I, there would be a copyright infringement. I would be plagiarizing or whatever you call it. Folks, the New Testament writers looked at the Old Testament and they, had, they, they felt the freedom to quote and use the Old Testament in the way in which they saw best to make a point. They were not held to any standard that we're held today as far as making sure that it's exact words in parentheses. And the reason why they felt that freedom is because they were filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit was the author of the Old Testament and he's going to be the author of the New Testament and did not ask, have to ask permission to change or to change the wording of the, the sentence structure or any of those types of things because he's the author of both. Does that make sense? There are clearly cases, and I could give you lots of examples, where when the New Testament writers, um, in fact, you know, scholars have said that you know, there's over 200 or 250 plus references uh, to the Old Testament. Um, a good number of those uh, are, uh, and, and then there's, if you add allusions to the Old Testament, there's like 600, 700 plus. So, you know, that, that constitutes a pretty large percentage of the New Testament. Um, but I want you to understand that the New Testament writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, what we do and what, we, what, what, scholar, what modern scholarship universally does is they apply to them a standard in which exists today. You can't do that. You can't do that. That standard did not exist then. So if, if the Holy Spirit led Matthew to go back, or Paul in many instances, to go back when he's writing the book of Hebrews and have a special understanding of a reference or a quote he is going to be allowed to, in some cases, maybe even take that quote out of its Old Testament context and use it. And, of course, people today in, modern, in our modern world cry foul at that. You can't do that because, you know, that's manipulating the text. That's, uh, you're, you're, you know, it's borrowed. You're, you know, you're, you're using a, a some, you know, you're, you're manipulating things. You guys see the problem with that. You can't apply those standards. All right, what, what's, what's your thoughts? Kyle, share your wisdom with us. <laughs> no, I don't have it. I was thinking of Hebrews 2, 6, in that same light. Uh, in verse 5, it says, not subject... Uh, he did not subject angels to the world to come concerning which we were speaking, but one has testified somewhere saying, what is man? You know, just, just to your point about the way they referenced Old Testament passages, he's referencing Psalm 8 there, but he doesn't attribute it to Psalm 8 in any form or manner whatsoever. just says somewhere these words. Yeah. And, and he goes on to quote Psalm 8. You guys, don't be troubled that the New Testament writers pulled 
phrases, used, used quotes in, in a way that the Old Testament writers had no intention. <laughs> Don't be troubled by that because I will tell you that college kids going to school, all of those things are being thrown in their face for saying the Bible is, was written way after it claims it was written by men who were flawed, who made mistakes, and they never should have used the Old Testament that way because they didn't have the right to. Somehow they decide that somehow they're the, they can just say that. But, but that's the kind of mess that is being propagated in modern scholarship. Yes? Just, and just for clarification, I, I think I'm fairly confident I understand what that's saying there. But uh, when it says it's urged that cannot have held the doctrine of plenary inspiration, that's just in maybe more layman's terms for me. The, the Old Testament was not fully inspired by God. Yeah, so the, the idea of plenary inspiration is, is that the words are inspired. Yeah. Um, so we, we use that. So if you know, we are, as members of the church, we are plenary, plenary, we believe in plenary inspiration. That is that the words are inspired. Um, there, there are various types of inspiration. There is you know, thought inspiration. There are various types of inspiration that people would contend but we would, we would believe that the words are inspired. So if the words are inspired, and, and the New Testament writers are using them in the way that they're using them, somehow you know, that, that invalidates plenary inspiration. It does not. Any thoughts? That's exactly this? right. Why did they write this? And this is not what was written. And that is the inconsistency, I think, that you're talking about that skeptics, you know, used to try to drive a wedge in our faith. That's and, exactly right. And, and so... And it's the case that many times that when it says it is written, <clears throat> when you go to your Old Testament, what text are you looking at? You're looking at a Masoretic text, right? That's not from Greek. There's no Greek translation involved in your Masoretic text in your Old Testament. But you go to the Greek, you go to the Septuagint, or you go to the Greek translation of it, and you'll find it almost word for word. Why is that? <laughs> well, the answer is because Paul and the apostles were writing in Greek. They weren't, they weren't writing in Hebrew. They were writing in Greek. So that, that is a... a, a, a that, that's the number one, it should, that demonstrates that there is value in the Greek translation. There's value in it, in that when the New Testament writer says, and it, and, and it was written, well, it, you may not find it very clear in the Old Testament, in your Masoretic text, but you'll find it much more clear in the Greek, in the, in the Greek translation. Thank you for that. It's going to be gibberish, yeah. 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 And, and, and Hebrew is the worst because Hebrew doesn't really connect to the English. I mean, it, I mean we get our English from the Greek and Latin. Um, we don't get, English has no connection to Hebrew. And I know that personally from the grades that I made in, in my Hebrew class. <laughs> um, so it, it, it was, uh, it's, it's very difficult to translate because, uh, you know, the, here's the other thing too, guys. When did the Hebrew language get, when did you start getting pointing and actually where you get vowels? Way later. I mean, in the ninth century, 10th century. And so before that, um, you're looking at a, all consonants <laughs> with, with no pointing. In other words, you didn't know necessarily how to emphasize a, a particular letter. It was, it's a very difficult language. Um, and so, uh, I mean, uh, translating that into Greek was a monumental task. And this idea about 72 guys coming up with the same word for it is, is a joke. I mean, it's just, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, one of the things I, w I, would, I would encourage you to do is to, th there is a wonderful short book 
that's called God's Secretaries. And it's a book about the King James translators that were chosen. It's not a heavy read, it's not overly complicated, but it's a, it's a little biography on some of the men who translated the Bible, of course, from existing Greek and Hebrew manuscripts that existed at that time, 1611, and, and what process they went through. It was a agonizing process that took years. And, um, and these men were, I mean, some of them were from all walks of life. They weren't all priests. They, some of them were, they were brilliant linguists. But what's interesting is, is that they called themselves, they didn't want to call themselves translators. They called themselves secretaries of God. And the reason why they did that is because they, they had in their minds, in the heart, a desire to make sure that it was not their words that were coming out of that translation. They, they really, truly wanted to translate the words of God. So th this begs the question, is a, um, when, when the New Testament writers were quoting from maybe a Greek translation, um, were they insinuating or inferring that that translation was inspired? That's a little bit of a loaded question. But what would you say? What would you say? Okay. So that gets into a tricky, so are <laughs> the words that I am reading inspired, right? <clears throat> okay. So is a translation right. inspired? Okay, so so here, here's the here's the answer, and that is is that there's there's no way, shape, or form that the New Testament writers, in quoting the Old Testament, thought that the that the that the Greek translation was inspired. It was flawed. There's no question it was flawed. But what they what they believed is that in its original language it was inspired. But, but, you know, here's the thing. Is God going to hold us to that standard if we can't read Hebrew? I mean, so uh, I hope not. We'll all, we'll all fail. So that's why we want the best translation from the Hebrew. Does that make sense? Folks, I can have you open your Bibles right now in your revised, in your new English translation. And there, there's certain segments, certain passages I could point out to you that are that if we went back to some of the oldest and, and most reliable, just to quote some of your, <laughs> what the oldest and most reliable, there's some problems in that. So, if you, so in those very few passages where there may be a translational problem, what do you do? If you really want to find or, or, or obtain the true words, the inspired words, well, in some cases, you're going to have to look at the Greek or look at the Hebrew, which thank goodness today takes a couple of clicks of a button on the internet. And maybe we should have a class. I, I remember, do you guys remember when I did that? I kind of walked you through how to use an online transliteration or, or basically to kind of, to, you weren't here, but were any of you in that class where we kind of walked through how to do that on the computer? How to look at, how to, you because you can, you can actually, it's called the interlinear Bible. It's called an online interlinear Bible. And, and so what you do is you, you can go to a New Testament passage and you can put it in Greek. And it's okay if you don't know Greek because you can click on that word and it will tell you exactly what that word means in the original language. Um, and so, and then of course a lot of commentary, a lot of commentators will convey to you what the Greek means in those passages. But here's the thing, and this is the point that we made in this class earlier, and I'll make, it, I'll make the point again. Of the quote-unquote issues in translation that may exist in our current Bibles, there's nothing that changes doctrinal or salvation point issues at all. You know, how many passages in the New Testament tell us that we need to be baptized? I mean, there's half a dozen at least and inferences even more. So, you know, but there's not a single disputed passage that, that connects to baptism. 
or to repentance or to any of those things. Um, and so, so the answer to my question is, is did the New Testament writers consider the Greek translation that they may have been, may or may not have been using as an inspired translation? I don't think that was even in their mindset. What they believed is that in its original language is inspired. Does that make sense? So, I, so what that means is, is that, you know, is your, is your Bible, is your translation inspired? Does that mean that, you know, what I would say is that the words that we have here are inspired because they've been translated, you know, again, we, we have a, a faithful translation of the Bible. Um, and, uh, you know, but were these seven guys, or, you know, were these 72 guys that were brought up from Jerusalem, were they inspired to produce that translation like Augustine thought they were? No way. They weren't inspired. Okay, let me stop. Luke, what's your thoughts? I had a question. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't know if like, come in with this. <laughs> uh, so, my question is, the, the format of the Bible we have today would be very different than when they were quoting from it. I mean, am I correct? Like, the, the broken down chapters and then broken down... That's way verses. late, of course. That's, that's so, yeah. I just couldn't help but wonder if when they're quoting these things, they're quoting paragraphs, not chapters and verses. I think it's a very good point, and it, and it goes to the point of... Of, of applying our modern day standards and our modern day fashion of writing on them and placing those yeah. those same requirements on them. That's, Surely. Well, that's what you get me. I was just thinking about those papers and those right. and I thought, well, if I had to quote something from an Old Testament book, I'm going to quote out of that general reading that whole book. Right. And, and, and the thing is, is that would you, you know, today in our modern MLS and Chicago manual, whatever manual you're using, you can't do that. You, you can't summarize a quote without citing it. But if you're the original author, you can summarize it all you want. You can summarize it, you can tweak it, but I think that the problem is is that the modern, modern, the modern world that we live in and modern scholarship, the guys that are teaching at the universities do not believe in the miraculous. They do not believe in that there is a they do not believe in a divine, uh, any divine breaking of, 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 of the laws of nature. They don't believe in miracles. And if you pull that component out of the, of the, of the, of the, of the creation of the, of the New Testament and Old Testament, then you do. You have major problems. Yes? <clears throat> Absolutely. And yet, and so you put that over here, some pretty cruddy translations that I can converse somebody with, and yet it's, it's incredibly important to believe that the actual individual words were inspired in matter. It almost seems like that's a, that's a, it's almost really like a mental contradiction. Like, and that's the issue with the Septuagint also, is once you start saying that the words, you know, even if it's a bad translation, we can still get there, the words don't really matter, then all of a sudden the words don't matter, but they really, really do. The original right. words are incredibly important, and we know what the, most, <clears throat> the original Greek words are. And those, not the idea, but the actual word was inspired. That's really important, even though I know that there are some words in this English that probably aren't exactly accurate. Yeah. And you've got to kind of be able to handle that contradiction all the time. Yeah, it is. But let me just say this, and because we don't have much time left, but you know, it was not until really post-Renaissance that there was ever really even a discussion about inspiration. I mean, there, the, our understanding and our discussion that we have about inspiration, I mean, it, it's, it's very post-Renaissance, it's very John Locke, it's very scientific, it's very, you know, X plus Y, you know, it, it, I, the, the, the everyday Christian for centuries after the New Testament was translated, I mean, it was God's word. I mean, there was, no, there was no detailed discussion about what was inspired or what, what isn't inspired. And to make your point uh, and to emphasize it, I mean, on, on Act, in Acts chapter 2, when 3,000 people 
gave their lives to a man who had been killed a few weeks earlier, um, what did they do that based upon? Did they, was it some hermeneutical breakdown of, uh, did, he have to, did, did Peter have to clarify which, who he's quoting from and which, which text he was quoting from Joel from? They didn't need that stuff. They needed the words, right? They needed the words. And so it's a, it's a meat and milk thing. You know, if, if we're studying with someone who has maybe a third grade education, going to the King James Bible is not a very good place to study the Bible with them from. I mean, the NIV is probably a better, better way to start from. Or in some cases, even, you know, the message or whatever. I mean, in some cases, that's the place to start. And then as you get into more meaty matters, then you, then you, you go into those, you, you maybe get into the text and get into the meaning of those words and those types of things. So I hope this has been helpful. I, and I, I hope it's not been too, you know, uh, too much to grasp. But I, this is, I think, really important uh, to help, to, to allow us to help defend our faith on, on and what we believe about the gospel and its, its translation. And, you know, this was not intended to be apologetics. I mean, I, there's... You could, you could, we could deliver a lot of information to, to prove to you that the Bible's accurate in a scientific way, in a prophetic way, textual, all those types of things. Manuscript-wise, that's not the purpose of this class. But anyway, thank you. Look forward to seeing you Sunday. And uh, we'll continue. We'll, we'll get out of the, the intertestinal writings. And we're going we're gonna to get into, again, the... The Roman government and justice, that's kind of what's on our, our list for 12.5. Um, I know we're a little ahead, but we're, we've, we've kind of chased some rabbits, so we'll, we'll, we'll be good. So thank you guys.